in a transmission model, we typically split the population into a number of different groups that represent epidemiologically important groups. Um, and typically we would split them into susceptibles, those who have never been exposed to the virus, an exposed class who may have who've been exposed but have not yet developed uh, infectiousness and infectious overt disease, an infectious class, and then a removed class. And that removed class in Ebola could be people who've died or people who've recovered. So we try and estimate and measure how people move between these different classes. Uh, and uh, the critical component of a transmission model is that the rate at which individuals go from the susceptible to the exposed class is dependent on the number of infectious people in the population at a given point in time. So if there's more infectious people in the population, then the risk to susceptibles is, is correspondingly greater. The idea of the model is that it summarises the epidemiology um, in a simple form that is in some way tractable, maybe mathematically, or so it can be summarised mathematically, or it can be put on, on a computer. It doesn't include everything, um, so it's, it's only got the key points. It's a bit like a cartoon of the, uh, of the, of the epidemic. And you can use it then to both gain understanding of what's going on, um, and then also you can use it for making predictions about what might happen. The approach tends to be to make sim simple assumptions about the contact behaviour because um, more complicated assumptions would require data that is just not there. And so the simplest assumption is homogeneous mixing. That means uh, people mix randomly within the population. Clearly they don't. If mixing is much more clustered, uh, then the, 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 uh, the infection would spread uh, less quickly in the population as a whole and less people in the end are likely to be infected. When we're looking at the numbers of cases, um, we know that we are not capturing all of the cases. There are other cases of infection that are, that are occurring. And if a large number of infections are not reported or a large number of infections are subclinical or, um, you know, so they're, they're, or doesn't have very overt symptoms, um, then it could be that the numbers of cases that we see is only a very small fraction of the total number of infections occurring in the community. And this matters a lot. The reason why those epidemics stop, so the reason why an epidemic peaks and then comes down, an epidemic such as that peaks and then starts to decline, is because you start to uh, run out of susceptible individuals. So it's susceptibles that are, in some sense, they're like the, the fuel to the fire. And if you remove the fuel, uh, then the fire starts to dampen out. And that's the same for a, a, a big epidemic. Um, and the problem in terms of predictions uh, is that if you're not observing uh, many of these cases and not observing many of these infections because they're subclinical, uh, then the, the predictions over a long time course of the, of the epidemic are going to be uh, out by perhaps orders of magnitude. One of the key problems with modelling over a long time course over the course of an epidemic is that uh, people may well change their behaviour. So embedded within the transmission models is some assumption about how people contact each other, so how uh, susceptibles become, come into contact with cases and transmission occurs. There's reasonably good evidence that behaviour has changed, but exactly what has occurred um, and whether we can make any predictions about behavioural change is very difficult. The mathematical models tend to assume that, that behaviour is, is, is not changing and that's almost certainly not the case. Interpreting model predictions I think you need to be careful, particularly over the longer term. Models may be useful for giving a, a sketch of what might occur uh, um, if the, the assumptions that have been put in are reasonable. So, but in terms of accurate predictions over the longer term, I think they're not, uh, we're not at that stage where we can, we can do that. We don't have the biological knowledge. The reproduction number for Ebola is not much above one, um, particularly now in each of the, uh, particularly in all of the settings, it's not a lot above one. And under those circumstances, chance also plays quite a major role in driving the epidemic. I think there are a couple of areas where the models have been useful in this epidemic. 
First of all, in predicting the numbers of beds that might be required. So earlier in the epidemic in particular, we were working with colleagues to try and estimate how many cases that may occur over the next few weeks and the length, uh, take into account the length of stay in hospitals by an average Ebola patient and in fact variance in that as well to say how many beds may be required. We can make predictions about the potential impact of different interventions, either interventions that have occurred like expanding hospital bed capacity and we can see whether that might have had an impact on the epidemiology or interventions that are planned such as uh, the potential role of new vaccines. There's lots of different ways you can deliver a vaccine. Um, you can deliver it to everybody in the population, but that requires a lot of vaccine, of course. You can target certain age groups. You can target geographical areas that are most at risk or have most cases recently, um, and so on. And you can use mathematical models to run through these different scenarios before you actually have to do them in the, so you can see which ones are, are likely to bear most fruit in terms of being able to prevent the epidemic in the most efficient way. We've been looking at how uh, the, what the impact of it expanding the numbers of beds available. Um, so for instance we've uh, the, the, there's been a, a recent decline in the reproduction number in um, Western area in, in Sierra Leone. The models have been used to suggest that the expansion of bed, bed capacity that is planned might just be sufficient to be able to to help turn the epidemic around, and that means drive the reproduction number to below one.